You've heard a lot from Lloyd Berg uh, in our meeting today. He's also going to do our program. He's wearing a lot of hats. Uh, our program is uh, Lightning Protection for Amateur Radio Stations. Uh, Lloyd is the past president of uh, the Madison DX Club. Just let me tell you something interesting about Lloyd. Back in 1970, 50 years ago, at age 17, 17, Lloyd got an internship at Channel 3 te Television in Madison. And in that same year, at 17 years old, he got his first class radio telephone license. And that's when they made him uh, part of the permanent engineering staff of Channel 3 uh, Television in Madison. And following that, he went on to a 50 year career as a uh, broadcast engineer, uh, building and maintaining um, uh, AM, FM, and uh, TV stations in different parts of the country. So, you know, Lloyd has a lot of knowledge about, um, about lightning, about lightning protection, and uh, what we can do to try to prevent uh, damage from our stations. So uh, with that, Lloyd, uh, please uh, go ahead with your program. I'm really looking forward to this. Okay, thank you, Bob. I appreciate those kind words. Um, I've been messing around with uh, radio and therefore dealing with the threat of lightning since I was a kid. Um, I had a simple shortwave listener, long wire antenna. One summer afternoon, I was holding onto the receive end of the wire and a bolt of lightning came down in the neighborhood. Uh, I got a heck of a shock. I was thrown against the wall. I wasn't seriously burned, but a memorable event for me that I think of every day when I either look outside or grab onto an antenna wire. Um, as Bob said, I, uh, I was a very active uh, uh, electronics kid. My high school had an excellent high school electronics program. And... Uh, I uh, wound up securing an intern position with uh, one of the local TV stations. Now, the interesting part is the chief engineer was Walter Haru, W9HSL. And uh, we immediately became friends. And uh, he allowed me to uh, tag along with some of his engineering projects. He ran a side business called Broadcast Engineering Services, Inc., or BESI, and uh, provided A to Z services for uh, radio and television stations in the upper Midwest. Uh, and that included uh, not only electronic work, but he also had uh, several uh, uh, qualified tower climbers that worked for him. So you got a problem with your antenna, you call Walter and uh, he'll have somebody out there and uh, fix you up right away transmitter problems, we'll get somebody right over there. Well, along came solid state electronics and stations that hadn't had any trouble for years and years and years, all of a sudden were getting blown up every time lightning went by. Um, so this was a whole new area to lightning proof radio and TV stations uh, in the age of solid state. Um, so I, uh, I got to learn from him and eventually I went out on my own and uh, worked for a number of broadcast stations and also operated a broadcast services business on the side and uh, wound up with a uh, lot of interesting situations. Um, this is my current tower. Uh, Field. I actually have two more than this. They're both received towers. So I've got a lot of chances to be negatively affected by lightning. Oh, by the way, that's me at the TV station uh, 51 years ago. Uh, master control operating was a lot of hard work. It was a lot of loading films and videotapes that you needed two hands to pick up the tapes. They were, they were huge and heavy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, the station was about half tube and half transistorized. The uh, transmitter was entirely tube type. And uh, 
uh, it was uh, interesting to uh, be part of the ushering in of solid state electronics. Unfortunately, I, or fortunately, I wanted to spend full time on engineering rather than master control operating and uh, loading tapes and such. So that's, uh, that's why I, uh, after five years at the television station, I left uh, to take a chief engineer position elsewhere. So we're gonna talk about lightning. This is a remarkable picture, not because of the bolt hitting the tree, but because you can see the streamers also called leaders. And I found many other pictures on the internet, but most of them were copyrighted, so I can't reuse them, unfortunately. But, uh, you know, the, uh, as the lightning charge was building up, it was looking for paths to discharge through. And uh, it almost hit that little tower over on the left there. And it almost hit the left side of the tree but it decided to go down uh, right down the center of the tree eventually. And you can see the uh, <clears throat> path it took down the tree. Now I theorize that the uh, reason that uh, the uh, lightning bolt didn't hit the tower over on the left side is because it did a fairly effective job at draining the leader charge out before the uh, full force of the lightning bolt came through. The tree was uh, a, a lesser drain, and uh, so uh, lightning bolt uh, went where it uh, was happiest. And that's an important lesson because we're going to talk about the uh, the leaders uh, um, a couple of times in this presentation. Um, the National Electrical Code is is vitally important for a couple of reasons. Um, uh, legally, uh, you have to follow it. Uh, your insurance for your house is based on things uh, adhering to the National Electrical Code. The uh, building inspectors that looked at your house while it was being built and wired uh, demanded that the electrical code be followed. And uh, we're not going to tell you anything different than First of all, you have to follow the National Electrical Code. Um, now, uh, we also have some other inadequate information about lightning grounding. This is a typical Roan tower-based grounding kit. This is still online and in their current catalogs. Here you've got you know, a tower, don't know if it's guide or self-supported, uh, and it's got a little uh, pipe clamp there and a little ground wire and then a ground rod. Um, I asked the uh, uh, Roan rep one time, how come you have to have the ground rod six inches below soil? And he said, that's so you don't hit it with your lawnmower. And I thought about that. I went, yeah, but how do you know if the ground clamp uh, came loose or not? He says, well, you have to dig it out and check it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm sure everybody does that. So here's an actual uh, Roan tower with an actual ground on it. And I consider that terribly inadequate. It meets code. It'll drain the static charge out of the air for you. But if lightning decides <clears throat> that's my target, uh, you are in trouble. Here's one of my tower legs. I, I ground the heck out of things. That's something I learned from Walter in the broadcasting business. Uh, I recommend hams disconnect whenever there's a lightning storm uh, possible, but broadcasters can't do that. They have to keep going right through the storm and you know, damn the torpedoes, we're staying on the air. So uh, this is the type of uh, grounding you find in broadcasting. This is two inch copper ground strap. Ground strap is far less inductive than a piece of wire. It can handle, each one of those can handle, you know, <clears throat> basically a full lightning bolt and survive and you know, get hit again and again. You also notice there's plenty of electrical grease on there to prevent the galvanization uh, eating away the metal. That's also an important element is to keep the grounds good and not cause any structural damage to the tower. I also ground all the transmission lines coming down the tower with the grounding kits. I use hard line and uh, 
every one of them is grounded as they get down to the base of the tower long before they come into the house. This is what the other end of the path looks like at my house. <clears throat> Again, you've got uh, ground strap connected to, in my case, a perimeter wire all the way around the house. And uh, this is where all my coax lines come in. Uh, the uh, vertical ground strap there goes outside to the perimeter. I, I might have said that. Uh, and this is uh, with the uh, first uh, nine uh, transmission lines hooked up. Since, since then, I filled up all the ports. I also really like the trip light um, ISO bars for uh, surge protection on the power line. And I've got two 240 volt outlets uh, as well. Uh, another look at that uh, ground bus in the ham shack. In fact, that's right behind me here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's that, that's it right there. I've been using it for uh, about 12 years now. Uh, have been hit by lightning in that time too. And there's a close up of the isobar. Uh, grounding. Uh, ground every piece of equipment that's got a ground stud on it. Your, your rig, your power supply, uh, amplifiers, antenna tuners, whatever you've got, use those ground lugs. Uh, I also ground my computers and that I had to put a bolt hole in that because uh, most computers don't have a ground lug. Helped a lot with radiated computer noise, uh, even if you're not trying to protect it from uh, RF or uh, lightning. Uh, grounding a computer case is a wonderful idea for shack computers. I uh, also have antennas for watching television in the attic because when we got a big storm going over, I usually watch uh, the uh, weather on TV. And uh, if you have antennas in the attic, that's fine. Make sure the lead-ins are grounded. Don't just have it floating. Uh, this is my uh, cable TV connection. I since dropped the cable and just watch off air now. Uh, and the telephone protection. Again, all of them grounded to copper strap. <coughs> I also have a central uh, surge protector uh, for the house. And I have another one over here uh, going to the entertainment center. And I ground all the metallic pipes in my house. This is the gas pipe. And that's my water piping. Yeah, hot and cold and filtered and someday maybe water softened. And uh, this is a, uh, a uh, oh, I guess I'll call it a pictorial of a wind turbine ground system. But this is totally applicable to amateur radio uh, uh, tower installations. Uh, notice the multiple ground rods under the or around the uh, tower. Also notice the um, ground connection from the tower going over to the utility ground at the house. Thirdly, notice the blue line. That's the, uh, in this case, the power wires from the, the uh, generator up on the uh, tower, but it could just as easily be your transmission lines uh, from your antenna coming into the shack. Now, uh, when you have uh, antennas, uh, be they uh, on a tower or a vertical or a dipole strung up between a couple of trees, <clears throat> you want to ground the uh, transmission line as it comes uh, straight down. Don't run the transmission line from the center of the dipole into your house. Give it a chance to go straight to ground and then horizontal across or under your lawn to your entry point to your house. Uh, these are uh, grounding kits that uh, DX Engineering makes. Um, you'll find DX Engineering has a lot of useful things uh, for uh, lightning protection. Uh, another source of very, very good lightning uh, protective uh, is uh, Georgia Copper. 
And uh, I have quite a bit of that here, and I will show you uh, that in just a minute. But uh, Georgia Copper and DX Engineering will sell you copper strap and clamps and pretty much anything you'd need. And uh, I'm going to talk about three types of protection here. First of all, we'll start small. Lightning protection for attic antennas. There's a number of people that just have a dipole strung up in the attic. And uh, that's okay, but provide a ground connection for the coax cable in the radio room, be that upstairs or downstairs in the basement or whatever. Um, that uh, ground connection should have a pretty short path to the utility ground rod, or at least the electrical ground on the uh, central panel or breaker box. Once again, always connect the ground studs on your equipment, transceivers, tuners, amps, or whatever to that radio room ground. And uh, even though it's in the attic, I suggest disconnecting uh, the coax cables and ground them when not in use. And one of the reasons is when you get a bolt of lightning, you not only get a lot of electrons, you get a really strong magnetic field. And as that magnetic field sweeps across your house, every metallic object in your house all of a sudden takes on a charge from that uh, magnetic pulse going by. So, uh, you know, even for things in the attic, you know, uh, you, you got to protect it. Uh, let's see. Also, I recommend, as I did, that you just uh, bond all the metallic pipes in your house, your chimney flue, uh, you know, water and gas, uh, tie them all into that electrical ground. Uh, uh, to, it, it reduces your noise. Uh, it may provide a better ground for your signal if your antenna is close to the house and, uh, you know, it drains away that magnetic pulse static or just static electricity in general. Um, let's see, next slide. Medium amateur radio stations. Now, uh, this would be a minimum of one ground rod out at the base of your vertical antenna. I recommend more than one. Uh, I like multiple ground rods. Try to get as much of that uh, lightning bolt into the ground as you can. Um, Again, use copper ground strap for grounding, um, or there are several techniques for direct ground rod connection too, although I find them mechanically kind of difficult. Um, coax lines coming off your dipole strung up between trees or what have you, don't angle them off toward the house. Go straight down and have some ground rods at directly underneath the dipole. Uh, have a ground connection there to drain off static. And, you know, if lightning hits, you really want that uh, ground rod or ground rods out there. Even if you disconnect the coax cable and, you know, throw it out the window or whatever, you still need a ground out there under the antenna. Uh, the antenna ground point should be tied into your utility ground if you leave the line into the house continually. If it's something you just get out on weekends and you wind up and, you know, it, is, it doesn't go anywhere, then, then maybe you can keep them isolated. But I, I'd recommend you tie them together. Uh, you can get some huge voltage gradients in the ground if a lightning bolt comes down uh, near your house or near your tower or near your antenna. Uh, again, low inductance copper strap is the best way to go. And uh, assuming you have a permanent radio room or a bench or a desk somewhere, make sure that's got a good single point ground that you can tie all your equipment into in that ground uh, in the radio room. Uh, let's see, I still like to ground all my system lines, rotor lines, uh, control lines, and uh, center conductor and the outer conductor on the coax lines when they're not in use. Broadcasters can't do that, but we can. So 
So why not uh, take that uh, extra precaution? Uh, let's see. Again, connect the ground stud on your transceiver and other equipment to the radio room ground. And I recommend again that all metallic pipes, uh, chimney flues, everything else be bonded to the ground system. All right, for the larger amateur stations, and we have quite a few of those in the club, including mine, minimum three ground rods per tower, one for each leg. If you can do two or three, for each leg spaced about eight feet apart, uh, even better. Again, use copper ground strap for grounding. Uh, the National Electrical Code lets you use uh, number four or number six solid. Uh, let's use the ground strap. You want to you give that lightning the easiest path to ground that you possibly can. Uh, coax cable should be bonded to the tower top and to the tower bottom. Uh, no running coax cables down the guy wires. Even if it saves you, you know, 20, 30, 40 feet of wire going to the house, don't do it. Cables go straight down the tower and uh, get grounded. Uh, there's a number of uh, things you can get for grounding cables at the bottom of the tower, which I mentioned at uh, DX Engineering. Uh, let's see. The towers tower or tower should be tied into any other grounds. Don't have separate grounds for each thing. The uh, telephone and cable and electric should all share the same ground. And uh, my uh, perimeter wire around the house connects uh, very securely to that shared ground, the utility ground, as well as having a whole bunch of uh, ground rods around the house a few feet out from the foundation. Uh, let's see, again, uh, I like to bond all metallic uh, things in the house, chimneys and pipes and such. Uh, and I also, as I showed you, I like uh, low inductance copper strap from the ground system to the radio room. Uh, don't rely on the electrical ground. That's um, going to be... Uh, not good enough. Uh, for one thing, it picks up uh, that magnetic pulse from the lightning hitting your tower and turns it into a whole lot of electricity. Um, let's see. Uh, all lines bonded to the common ground bus in the shack. I showed them the one on my wall. Um, connect the ground studs on the equipment to that same shack ground. And I also like to disconnect and short to ground all the lines when I'm not using them. Uh, one of the things I noticed with some of my uh, coax cables is when the sky would darken, you'd start hearing tick, 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 tick. And I looked at the uh, ends of the open connectors and there's little lightning bolts. Uh, it looks like a spark plug going off just from a gray cloud overhead. No, no lightning in the area. And, and that taught me to ground everything even when uh, you know, you don't have a storm condition going on. So uh, that's my uh, presentation. I'd like to show you a couple items here. And uh, first thing, ground strap. This stuff is great. Broadcasters buy this in four, six, or eight inch widths and connect everything together with it power transformers and transmitter cabinets and transmission lines and, you know, the utility entrance. And uh, this is what allows broadcasters to stay in business during lightning storms. Um, the uh, highest level of hits in a single storm at a, a tower I was working at is eight. Uh, that was down in uh, Tampa. Highest level here in Wisconsin was five hits in the same storm at channel three. Now, the two inch is kind of pricey. That's about 100 bucks worth there. You can also get one inch ground strap. And you can get half inch ground strap. If you've got a lot of big towers, use the two inch, at least out at the tower. Um, for in the shack, you probably can get away with one inch or half inch. 
Um, but again, you have to consider the cost of a roll of copper versus what happens if you get a lightning bolt hitting your tower and coming into the house. <clears throat> also for outdoor connections, put some electrical grease on those connections so you don't start eating away the galvanization on your tower legs. <clears throat> and then the um, final thing I would say is watch out for bad information on the internet. There's, there's things out there that say lightning never strikes twice in the same place. Baloney, that is so not true. <clears throat> but the, uh, the oddest thing I ran across is somebody said the way to prevent lightning is you get yourself a jar and you put the end of your coax cable in there and the lightning will leave you alone. <clears throat> when I heard that, I didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but it's, it's de definitely some silly advice from the internet. <clears throat> I'm going to get myself a drink and uh, I'm available for questions. <clears throat> Lloyd, there were a Lloyd, couple of uh, so written, that, um, there were a couple of written questions there. One was asking for the brand of um, electric grease you use, and another question I believe was using number four welding cable. I believe those were the written questions. Okay. Um, there's a number of different types of electrical grease. Um, specifically for what we're doing, uh, Georgia Copper um, sells anything you want. Uh, also, DX Engineering has a lot of different types of electrical grease available. Um, I think I bought this stuff at Home Depot, but uh, there may be better stuff out there. Um, and it doesn't improve your electrical connection. It just keeps it from deteriorating when, when water gets in there. So in other words, it prevents the water from getting into the connection. Um, I, I don't know about the welding wire. I think the gauge would work all right, but I don't know what the inductance is. I, I really recommend going with the flat ground strap it is just magically better than circular cable. And I, I can tell you the low frequency guys that are operating down on 136 kilohertz and 472 kilohertz, which is kind of right in the range of lightning, um, they have to use LITS wire uh, because with multi-strand wire or even solid wire, uh, you get a real bad uh, skin effect and it, it, it doesn't work near as well uh, for an RF ground. It, it's perfectly okay at 60 Hertz, but for, uh, you know, when you have a broadband uh, uh, bolt of lightning there, uh, you want really low inductance. So Litz wire probably would work and strap works, but I, I think I'd stay away from uh, circular conductors. Welding cable is kind of Litz, uh, wire. There's many, many, many strands in it, several hundred usually. So that might be a reasonable equivalent to LITS. Mm, well, I, I'd have to check into this, but uh, what I believe LITS is you have to weave it kind of like uh, women braid their hair with this real complicated uh, where the skin effect is, is forced in and out of the weave because each of the wires are insulated from all the other wires. Um, but I'd have to check into that deeper because uh, multi-strand wire and Litz wire are not the same thing. I think, like, go I, ahead. I think that regarding welding cable, the cost of welding cable would be possibly quite a bit more than the flat strap because you remember I work with used to work with thousands of feet of different gauges of welding cable and it's become uh, oh your high energy physics lab yeah oh yeah keep going then we want to hear about this so um very fine stranded welding cable has become ferociously expensive in the last couple of years I mean when it used to be 
and it used to be like a dollar fifty a foot for four gauge extra flexible <clears throat> welding cable. Now it's some of this stuff in one aught gauge is up as high as the power flex is up as high as seven dollars a foot. So I, I'd look at the flat strap and price it out. I, I bet it'd be cheaper. Yeah, uh, like I said, uh, this stuff's a hundred bucks for I don't know twenty five feet or something. But this stuff uh, is only 50 bucks and this stuff's 25 bucks. So, um, you know, for the tower, your, your tower's costing you thousands of bucks, spend the extra hundred bucks. Uh, for indoor work or, you know, strapping equipment together, this stuff should be just fine. Because if you've got the full force of the lightning bolt coming through your shack, you've got other problems than the gauge of your strap. <laughs> You want to keep the lightning outdoors. <laughs> I have lightning rods on my barn, and it uses the uh, the Litz type, you know, where it's woven together. It's kind of an impressive looking cable. It looks like the stuff, if you put your fingers in it, you'd never get them out, you know, like the Chinese finger thing. Oh, but sure. Lightning rods use. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, other comments or questions? Uh, going back to Greece, other... you were talking about? No, oh, we got about three of them. Uh, Ron, why don't you go ahead? Uh, going back to your grease you were talking about? Yeah. Is that a, a dielectric type grease? Oh, uh, it's an antioxidant joint compound, which is what I've been using. And I, I have been hit a few times. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it, it works. I oh, mean, oh. my house didn't burn down. I didn't lose all my electronics. <laughs> <clears throat> what would but, you say about copper coat? Uh, I do know that uh, Georgia Copper supplies that. I haven't tried it personally. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, I saw somebody else with their hand up there, and I forgot who it was. Other questions? Ted. Yeah, a comment on grounds. Um, we tend to consider grounds to be a holy thing with ultimate purity and no defects. I spent uh, a while doing uh, lighting protection stuff for industrial scale utility power plants. And in the process, learned a little bit about both grounds and lightning. Uh, for one, you pound a ground rod in the ground, and if you're lucky, you got maybe 10 ohms of ground resistance. A little bit of Ohm's law, discounting inductance will tell you that that average 50,000 ampere lightning hit is gonna build up about a half a million volts on whatever it hits that's grounded because the ground is not really a ideal ground. Yep. But the Japanese did some experiments, kind of Ben Franklin-like, and uh, I, I think they were extraordinarily courageous people. They shot rockets with wires on the back of them up into thunder clouds. Yes. And in the process, managed to cook off a half a million ampere lightning bolt. Put that against your 10 ohms and tell me how many million volts that is. Yep. It's also worthy of some thought that um, I know you're talking about lightning, but RF grounds and power line lightning grounds are not necessarily the same thing. They can be, but you know, your wire going down to the ground from your second floor shack may work fine for lightning, but it's probably pretty rubbery when it comes to for RF. The strap idea is wonderful. Um, strap works great. <laughs> I use it a lot. And I thank you for your presentation. It's uh, it's good to hear stuff from people that have felt the stroke. Yeah, and <clears throat> one of the uh, 
situations I was in in Florida is I used to climb towers quite a bit. In fact, it was kind of a natural high. And I was uh, up on a tower working on something and uh, started hearing all the little flange bolts screaming. It was daytime, so I couldn't see the, uh, the, uh, the corona, but um, I realized the tower was likely to be hit and I was a long way up the tower. So what I did is I just made sure my belt was good and tight and took my hands off the tower and supported myself with the feet uh, so that I wasn't holding the tower here and you know standing on it with my feet because as Ted said, uh, when you've got 50,000 amps, 100,000 amps or more, you know, and six feet of steel, you could have, you know, fatal voltages there if you were holding onto the tower at two places. And now this is something the uh, Florida tower climbers warned me about. Uh, the other thing they recommend is get inside the tower and don't be hanging on the outside, but I didn't have that uh, ability on that particular tower. So I, I sat there and just waited for the storm to go through, got soaking wet and uh, tower didn't get hit. So uh, I was lucky in that regard, but uh, there's, there's a lot of crazy things that happen around a lightning storm. I always wondered what happened to your hair. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <Burned it> all <laughs> off. Lloyd, uh, Ed, WA9GQK. On the lightning rod, or not lightning, ground rods themselves, I've always heard, you know, the eight foot ground rod is the gold standard, but what if, um, like say you're setting up at field day and you've got these little short ones or skinny ones, uh, do they offer anything? Uh, I would think it sounds like we should still put something at the bottom of the cable drop um, I think for, for static drains, that's fine. If you get a full bolt of lightning coming in there, that lightning rod's probably going to disappear, uh, as <coughs> is the wire it attached to it. Um, but yeah, draining the static charge out is important. And again, that big magnetic pulse surrounding the lightning bolt as it sweeps past you that needs to be run to ground as well. And so that that static ground is, is kind of important for several reasons, getting rid of leader charges and also draining the, uh, the pulse noise that uh, will be picked up by everything metallic. And I do see a lot of people, what they bring out is, are the skinny ones is usually the larger diameter, like half inch, does that help uh, better with uh, carrying the, the current off? Well, a larger diameter would have more surface area. And I think that that would help uh, a fair amount. Uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I see the ones that Radio Shack used to sell there. Uh, they got some kind of uh, gold color to them, but they're really pretty much all iron. And uh, those things turn to rust within a year or two. I, I really don't like those, but for a temporary installation, you know, that's certainly better than nothing. Okay, yeah, because one of my concerns now, uh, of course it works out. I didn't uh, get my ground rods off my tower out where they should be, but they are eight footers. And when I ran the cable, which is a uh, cable, probably gonna go get strapped now, over to my Edison rod, the Edison rod looked like they bought it at Radio Shack. And I know my ground rods, are easily twice the size and diameter. So probably I'm providing more of the ground for the house than the Edison is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I, I've noticed the National Electrical Code now is asking for two ground rods instead of just one for all new installations. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're, they're starting to realize that we need more grounding for protection, but uh, you know, even two ground rods is that Ted said is uh, pretty minimal. I think what you really need to do is pay attention to what Lloyd's talking about with respect to bonding. If when that lightning bolt hits your 10 ohm ground rod and you get a half a million volts, it doesn't matter if all of your equipment is at the same potential. When it matters is when some of it isn't. <laughs> 
and then you get big nasty long zappy things. Yeah, bottom yep. is really important. Plumbing, gas lines, uh, furnace ducts, all of that stuff. I have screwed together. Yep. One other trick when it comes to equipment is gas discharge tubes. They are just wonderful. Little Fuse makes them. DigiKey sells them. They're not much money. They're what are inside of all of the Alpha Delta things. You can buy them at any voltage you want from 75 volts up to 1,000 volts, and they'll pass thousands of amperes. And this little dinky thing that's about a quarter inch in diameter and three-eighths of an inch long uh, and then when the lighting bolt goes away, they reset and they're open circuits. Um, I don't use MOVs so much anymore. Those work so much better. Uh, speaking of uh, uh, protective things, um, you'll find this interesting. I was uh, uh, just happened to be at uh, Channel 13 in Tampa uh, it didn't work there, but uh, the chief engineer was a ham, and we were talking about stuff, and he said, hey, why don't you go up my H tower? Uh, they had a big studio tower about 100 feet tall, and it had a platform halfway up and another platform at the top, and uh, he... Um, uh, I, I think I went up there for a ham repeater or something that he had uh, located up there, and I got up to the top, and the railing on the top platform is all covered with what looked like Christmas tree garland. And it was wrapped all the way around. And I, I found that very interesting. And uh, when I got back down, I said, what's the Christmas tree garland doing at the top of your tower? And he said, oh, that's a lightning static drain. And boy, is it ever effective. He said, we used to get every single bolt of lightning that came along in uh, uh, the uh, west side of Tampa. And we put that up there and now the power lines get hit instead of our studio tower. <laughs> it was very effective for draining away those uh, the, the leader charges. And the tower I think was 100 feet tall and the, the power poles were probably somewhere around 60 feet. So uh, they were able to hand off the lightning problem to the utilities, which uh, I, uh, I, being a broadcaster, I kind of like that idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I add again, I work for Chicago Transit on the rail side, and most mm -hmm. of our shops out at the ends of the lines have the series of rods around the perimeter of the roof because we're sitting over a yard with 600 volt system in it with pretty much uh, a lot of current available. And I guess we're mainly ascribing to trying to, you know, drain down the charge before it reaches full lightning bolt status. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like um, they thought the jury was sort of out. Do you wait to get hit or do you try and trickle it off? And I notice any of our newer structures, they do the perimeter of uh, all the little rods all the way around and uh, they prefer to start getting rid of it before it builds up real bad. Yeah, hand it off to some other target, you know, like that tree getting hit instead of the light at the radio tower next to it. Uh, Lloyd, I wondered if you could comment on uh, any experience with thermite bonding of the ground wire to the ground rods versus using some type of, type of a clamping system to attach the wire to the rods. Well, uh, yeah, I would. And uh, the thermite is by far and away the best way to do it. Uh, clamps, you know, can, you know, uh, become high resistance. Um, here on my ground rods, um, I uh, wrap the strap around the ground rod and I use uh, two uh, uh, map gas torches and I can get it so hot that I can use the lead-free plumbing solder to attach to ground rods. And, uh, that's probably not as good as the thermite, but a, the lead-free solder does, uh, it's a plumbing solder that you can get at Lowe's, Menards, Home Depot, wherever. I think I use the Oatly brand, O-A-T-L-E-Y, or something like that. Um, it works pretty darn well. 
uh, and, and I feel is superior to the clamp on uh, type uh, connections. <clears throat> Takes a lot of heat though. I got a question. Go ahead. Yeah, on, on that um, galvanization between copper and your tower, there was a suggestion of putting a stainless steel strap between the copper and the tower, the galvanized tower leg to prevent the same thing. So you, um, you, you could, and that probably uh, would reduce the need for grease, but stainless steel is a really bad connect conductor. Uh, that'd be the only thing that that would turn me away from stainless steel, but uh, certainly having a, a larger surface area of contact would be a benefit. So that that is a possibility. And the other, thing, the other thing you guys are talking about discharging for uh, your tower, uh, the wireman's got uh, this what's called a porcupine. Oh, yes, I have that, seen They those. use that a lot down in Florida. Yes, you uh, do. To discharge, to discharge the uh, the static coming off, and it's prevented a lot of a lot of lightning strikes. It's yeah, a, a lot of like a lot of broadcasters buy those by the box in Florida. Yeah, but the problem is they don't work on AM broadcasts because it the, with AM broadcasts the whole tower is electrified. Well, yeah, and those things just throw fire day and night. But for the FM towers and the communications towers, yeah. They, they love them. Yeah. So the wireman sells them. Yeah. Well, that's good to know. I didn't know where you could get those. Yeah. Lloyd. Yes, sir. Um, there's a company. I don't remember the, the official name of it, but they sell a product called No Oxide. N-O-O-X-I-D. Yeah. And we use that stuff a tremendous amount for preparing a lot of our ultra high current connections because it you put it in there and you, you don't ever get any oxide in the joint afterwards. Sounds like a great product. I just looked it up. They're still in business. So cool. Yeah. Lloyd, um, I don't know if you're looking at the chat, but there's another uh, question here. Um, looks like I'm not sure who this is from. Uh, it's about disconnecting the coax uh, during storms. Uh, highly recommended. Uh, but I think the question is, okay, you disconnected it. Now what? What do you do with the All end right. of it? Uh, the coax I wanted disconnected was the one that goes between your ground point in the shack and your radio. The uh, coax that goes from your ground point out to your grounded tower, leave that it hooked up at both ends. You don't want, mm -hmm. you know, a conductor going 99% of the way to your house and then having a spark gap there because it, it's going to spark and you're going to get a fire yeah. out of that. So I, I sorry, I wasn't yeah, clear right. on that. I'm glad somebody mentioned that. It's good to remember that lightning bolt just came down from a mile in the sky. So another six inches isn't a lot. No. Nope. Uh, and again, yeah, my very first uh, ham radio lightning story, uh, my Elmer lived one street over. They had a disconnected CB vertical on the front of their house, and a lightning bolt out of the clear hit that thing, jumped from the coil cable on the floor to his wall box and fused his new 220 line all the way down to the basement. Wow. Yep, that can happen. Uh, Lloyd, hey, Lloyd, I got uh, one for you. Somebody also asked, uh, there was another question, uh, how to ground balance feed line? Well, uh, I would say uh, at the base of the tower where you're halfway between, well, no, that's probably used with a dipole. Um, yeah. That's a good question. Um, I'll have to ponder that one. That's, that's not something I've run into in broadcasting. So I would uh, defer to others that might have more knowledge. Ted, do you have any input on that? I would do three gas discharge tubes. One between the yeah. two conductors and one from each conductor to ground. And yeah, if you're yeah. gonna receive out of it or run low power, you can run 
you know, for just receiving one, 75 volt ones will work. If you're going to run a kilowatt, you need the kilovolt ones. But a thousand volts is still a lot more protection than you get with nothing there. Yeah, the old handbooks used to show an arrangement using homemade gaps and uh, between the two wires and from each wire out to a ground. That was before gas discharge was invented. So that was what they used to do was protect both wires with gaps. So gas discharge should be able to fix that too. They're like a, a spark gap, except they work the same every time, which you can't really say for a spark gap. Absolutely. And you also don't get the Jacob's ladder effect with a uh, gas discharge tube. Hey, Lloyd. Yeah. Um, I have a situation with Bob uh, WA9FBO here. I'm in LaPorte, Colorado. Uh, I got a situation that probably a lot of guys have. I'm down in the shack in the basement. Uh, the tower is 70 feet uh, that way. Uh, the utility ground is 50 feet that way. Uh, oh, on opposite choices. sides of the house. Yes, I can either not connect those two grounds together or I can connect them with a copper wire running through the basement, which is the worst. <laughs> uh, that happens frequently at broadcast stations and that's where they're out buying four and eight inch wide ground strap. Um, uh, the, the, all, the other alternative would be to uh, run a perimeter, well, I hate exactly. to say wire, a perimeter ground strap, um, which broadcasters frequently do around their uh, transmitter buildings um, for just that same reason is um, they know they've got to connect the utility ground to their tower ground because okay. if they don't, every single rectifier in their transmitter is going to get blown to bits the first lightning hit. So they have to keep the broadcast plant at the same voltage and lightning hits. The voltage goes way up, but it's, it's way up on both sides and then it drains back down. Uh, kind of like birds standing on electric wires. You know, the birds don't get shocked so long as, you know, they don't touch something else. They're just elevated to the level of that high line and um, you know no damage is done of course with a really really high voltage you know the half a mega uh, volt lines you get so much corona that uh, uh, the birds can't land on those but for the you know 68,000 volts or less lines they can sit on those wires and not get their feet tickled in, you know in the case of uh, in the case of of amateur stations, um, the power line ground is probably going to be the best ground you're going to find. But as Lloyd points out, the secret is making sure everything sees the same voltage. 90 zero 034. What I have done in, in my shack is run a three quarter inch piece of copper pipe from the, from the well. I'm, I'm in a rural area off to the utility ground. And then I've grounded everything on the way to it. The gas pipes, the plumbing pipes, the sheet metal for the ducts, all of that. And, you know, I get hit a lot. And, you know, sometimes- As do I. I. Well, most of the problem is those thousand foot beverages. Boy, do those things cut a lot of flux. <laughs> If I just give up on those, I wouldn't really have as much problem, I think. So a, a big piece of water pipe is a cheap way to get from one side of the house to the other, and it's pretty low inductance. Yeah. Well, the issue is, do you go through the house? I mean, going around the house is, is a no starter because there's sidewalk, there's landscaping, the XYL would never go along with that. I would run a four inch strap from one side of the house to the other, make as straight a line as you can. And hook everything on the way to it. Okay. Including your telephone ground and places like that that you wouldn't expect. Does the strap have to be insulated from the floor joists or anything? Uh, the broadcasters don't insulate their strap. Oh, and something we also ought to talk about is cement is fairly conductive. 
Uh, yeah. A guy named Herbert Ufer, uh, back in the yes. 1940s, was uh, contacted by the uh, Department of Defense. He worked at Underwriters Laboratories. And uh, the Department of Defense says, we've got this terrible static problem at our ammunition dumps and our, in our, in our factories. And uh, this particular one they were having trouble with, because, uh, you know, drawing shocks around piles of gunpowder is not really a very safe thing to do. And they said, help us find a decent ground. We put ground rods in and gee, they do next to nothing in this dry sand that we're sitting on. So uh, Mr. Ufer said, well, let's, uh, let's start running ground wires in trenches filled with cement and see what happens. And he wound up with a very effective grounding system using these uh, trenches filled with cement. And somebody else came along and said, well, you know, all that cement's got a mesh of steel uh, re-rod in it. Let's, uh, let's leave some of that re-rod sticking out of the cement and we'll hook that onto our ground system too. And that turned out to be very effective. And now the National Electrical Code uh, not only recommends UFER grounds for concrete buildings, they require it. So, um, you know, I would still just run that copper uh, from one end of the house to the other as uh, directly as you could. And uh, I'm not sure I've ever seen anybody try to insulate it. If everything in your house is already bonded to that copper strap, as Ted mentioned, uh, you're not going to have lightning bolts flying out of that ground strap. It's going to have just the opposite effect you won't have lightning bolts flying out of anything metallic in your house, uh, whether the, the tower in the backyard gets hit or the telephone pole out in the front yard gets hit. I forgot about the cement thing, Lloyd. Um, 40 years ago, we had a small experiment in a building on the other side of campus called the barn. And the barn was built so that they could build liquid hydrogen bubble chambers in it 50 years ago. And static was, had no place in there. So they made the floor conductive, the con entire concrete floor, the building conductive by putting tons of, tons of uh, powdered iron in the concrete when it was poured. Wow. You could, we tried an experiment. You could arc weld to that floor. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but did the floor rust? <laughs> yeah, you better believe it, Rusted. <laughs> yeah, iron and concrete generally get along really well, but uh, yeah, yeah if it's exposed, that'd be a different story. Look at all the CTA platforms in the centers of our expressways around Chicago. All those concrete ramps that were poured back in the 60s are exploding from the uh, rusting rebar inside. All wow. that salt spray they get every year. That's not good. I've had, I've had uh, at work, I've had as low as 460 volt arc across the floor. And it's not an enhanced concrete for that. It's just been conventional concrete. So yeah, you got to watch it. Uh, Lloyd, did you see the note? Well, I don't know if you saw the note, but you are in the log, by the way. Oh, really? Yay! Yep. Congratulations, <laughs> Lloyd. I, I Lloyd, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is not, not con necessarily concerning a lightning strike, but um, when I operate portable with my single Yagi, the coax the coax is just connected to the driven element it's not connected to the boom or the elements or anything and the boom is not connected to the mast either electrically because i i usually take a piece of uh, pvc pipe and put it over the aluminum tubing so i don't smash the aluminum tubing with the u-bolts 
so the net result is that the Yagi itself is is floating free and the driven element, the ground on my coax is not connected. Well, it's connected <laughs> through the hairpin match to the center conductor of the coax, but it's not connected to the boom. Um, so what I've been doing is, uh, is just grounding the, uh, the, sh the braid of the coax outside where I operate. Um, or when I do grid activations, I just, I just connect it to all the equipment, which is all connected through my uh, extension cord to the generator and the generator is grounded. I don't, I don't know. I, I just, I just want to know what you think of this system because it, it just, it, it, it bothers me that, that maybe something's wrong here, but I, but nothing has gone wrong yet, but I just, um, I would like to see you have a static ground on anything you put out there. I uh, wouldn't have to have ground strap on it uh, necessarily, but it would be nice to have uh, at least some DC continuity to keep, you know, whatever static charges might be out there from uh, causing you trouble. So you think I should... Uh put a ground strap around my boom to the and uh, and the mounting to the mast and then uh, then do I need to ground the mast or? uh yeah I I would say if if you could have a mast some kind of a ground system that would be very desirable um I realize you're talking about portable operations but I think you go all over the world with your portable equipment and uh, if you can't put it a ground rod into the ground, have some ground radials on the surface just as a better than nothing ground um, for <clears throat> static charges. And the ground radials don't have to be particularly long, maybe shooting from the hip, uh, you know, three or four 10 foot long bare copper wires or even aluminum wires just laying on the surface. And for, if if we're just concerned about static stuff from off the elements and, and things like that, it wouldn't take a whole lot to connect the boom to the mast, would it? I mean, I could just yeah. do that with a small yeah. wire. And, and a lot of antennas have insulated elements, and I just leave those alone, especially on a temporary a portable outfit. But uh, if you can bridge a little chunk of PVC plastic between the boom and the mast, uh, you know, with just even a little, you know, number 20 wire or something, I think that would be worthwhile or whatever mechanically uh, would be easiest for your installation. Yeah, I'm sure I could just get a little strap and put it uh, underneath the PVC and then underneath the U-bolt too. Yeah. And that, that should ground. Yeah, we're just, well, we're thank just talking you static that. here. Thank you very much. Yep, you're welcome. Any other questions? Well, if you think of questions, you can contact me at n9lb at arrl.net. And our website also has uh, uh, links to my email on it, madisondxclub.org, O-R-G.